So if the context is three dimensions, so we've got three variables like x, y, and z, and we put one constraint on that, then we're only left with two dimensions. So something that's two dimensional within three dimensions would be some kind of surface. Think about uh, maybe a bent piece of paper or um, the surface of a balloon, right? So if you're stuck on that surface, you really only have two freedoms, um, but even though that surface may curve within, within three dimensions. So, okay, so with one constraint in three dimensions, you get a surface, and we're going to work on just a single quadratic constraint. So this is what your general quadratic constraint could look like. Wow, that looks complicated, but you can see there could be linear terms in the three variables x, y, and z. There can be some cross terms, so an x times y, or an x times z, or a y times z, and then some, and then some squared terms, x squared, y squared, and z squared. That's all you can do if you limit yourself to having no more than two variables multiplied together. That's the maximum complexity. So we call this a quadratic constraint. This is your general quadratic constraint. Now, from something we mentioned earlier, if you have these cross terms, you actually, those could be absorbed into their corresponding um, yeah, they could be, they could be, well, actually, they could be rotated out. That's what we said. So we can, we can um, rotate out those cross terms. So we're really talking about something like this. And we want to break it down into just a few cases so we can consider all the different shapes that might occur. Now, bef now one of the things that can occur is what we call a cylinder. But when we say cylinder in this class, it might mean something a little bit different than what you're used to. So a cylinder is a surface that is generated by moving a straight line along a given planar curve while holding the line parallel to a given fixed line. The curve is called the generating curve for the cylinder. Now when, when we say cylinder, you probably think of a right circular cylinder, and that is an example of this. For example, here's, here's this equation, x squared plus y squared equals 4. Now, um, if the context is just two dimensions, so that there's only an x and a y, then of course that's just a circle. But if the context is three dimensions, then we have this constraint, x squared plus y squared has to equal four, no matter what z is, right? Z is free in this case. So if you were to think about, well, what if z is zero, you would see a circle of radius two here in the xy plane, right? So you'd see a circle of radius two in the xy plane, but of course, um, no matter what value of z you choose, x and y still have to draw a circle. So if you go up to a higher plane here, you'll still see that same circle of radius 2, radius 2, radius 2, radius 2. Obviously that is a right circular cylinder, right? It's infinite as it goes. There's no constraint on z at all. If you wanted to cut it off, you could put some inequalities that bound z. So, but as, it, as written, it's just basically a stack of circles. Now, how does that fit this definition of a cylinder? Well, this circle is the generating curve. And if you notice, um, it says generated by moving a straight line along a given planar curve while holding a line parallel to a given fixed line. Now, you can think of our given fixed line as any line that's parallel to the z-axis. So think of it as the z-axis or some other upright line like that. And what we're doing is we're taking that line and we're moving it so that it, it goes along the generating curve, which is the circle. So, so think of the cylinder, as you think about this definition, think about the cylinder as sort of, um, sort of a, a circle of lines, right? But our definition of cylinder is more general. So if you have any curve and you have a given direction, right? So a line, um, and you take a whole bunch of lines perpendicular to that and move them along this curve, See, that's going to create a two-dimensional surface. This one, the generating curve here, is just, uh, um, just a little curve. It doesn't even close up on itself. So like the circle closed up, right? It was a closed curve. But here's our generating curve. And that's creating a surface. You can imagine you could take a piece of paper and kind of bend it, right? And so that bend would be the generating curve. And that generating curve is just repeated. I'm not doing a good job of repeating it, but it's just repeated uh, all everywhere. And it's sort of you could think of it as the generating curve gets smeared as you uh, draw lines that are all parallel to each other, parallel to some given line through that. So our idea of a cylinder is much more general than just the usual right circular cylinder. We can make some interesting stuff. I, I made this one, um, x squared plus y minus z squared equals 4. This time we see a circle 
but for different values of z, the center of the circle is different, right? Because the center of the circle is, is, al is always at zero, whatever the value of z is. So when z is zero, so if you're in the xy plane, you see a circle of radius two centered at the origin. But then if you go up one to where z is one, you fix z equal to one there, then you have a circle of, of radius two centered at the point zero, one. So there's a circle over here. And the higher you make z, the further over um, the center moves. So when z is two, the center is here at x equals zero, y equals two. And we're up at z equals two. And you see we're going to get a cylinder. The generating curve is still a circle. But all the lines, instead of being parallel to the z-axis, are slanted in this case. So these lines are, right? And those are creating this, this uh, tilted cylinder. So it's not, a, it's not a right circular cylinder. It's a circular cylinder, but not a right circular cylinder. All right. Now, one case that we can see, other than like our regular cylinders here, would be to have um, so now we can go through and, and classify what can happen with a quadratic constraint with a quadratic constraint now if all of the co all of the the squared terms have zero coefficient then we're really down to something linear right we'd be down to just this is the equation you'll recognize that as the equation of just a plane if there aren't any squared terms so the next case then, the, one, the, only, the next one that would be truly quadratic so that there's at least one variable that's squared would be if there's only one squared term. If there's only one squared term, that then uh, for example, maybe there's no, there's no y squared or there's no z squared, their coefficients are zero. And we can ignore those. And of course, since there is an x squared term, by completing the square, we could always absorb the linear x term into the quadratic one. So we could simplify this a little bit more. Now in fact, we could rotate so that these this these variables become merged. Our idea would be, and you don't have to know how to do this, I'm just showing that you could do it, is you could let u be hy plus iz, and then let v be iy minus hz. And this is basically just rotating our coordinate system around the x-axis so that um, so that we're going to just have one variable. This will just reduce to u here. And so there'll just be a single variable there. So we might as well assume that we can do that. And so these two linear terms could be rotated so that they're together as a single linear term. Now, if you look at this, what you're going to have is a parabolic cylinder. As an example, suppose that a was 1 and uh, the coefficient of y was negative 1. Then if the context is just one dimension, if I solve for y here, I have y equals x squared minus 2. So if the context is just, sorry, it's just two dimensions, here's x, here's y, we have a parabola that opens down like this. Oops, I messed that up because there's a minus 2. So not that parabola. It's shifted down to, so this parabola. So we have the parabola here in the xy plane. Now, if the context is three dimensions, though, that means that no matter what z is, um, we always see that parabola. So if we look when z is equal to zero, oops, so here's my x-axis, my y-axis, and my z-axis. If z equals zero, we see this parabola, which now, now that we're looking kind of down on the xy plane from an angle, that, uh, let's see, that looks like this. We have this parabola opening back here. OK. And the thing is, no matter what z is, we see that same parabola. So we see when z is 1, we see the same parabola, right, in the plane z equals 1. But in the plane z equals 2, we see the same parabola, and so on. We have this stack of parabolas, or you could think if we take lines parallel to the z-axis and just move them along my generating curve, which is the parabola, then this is creating a parabolic cylinder. Not a circular cylinder, right, but a parabolic cylinder. Because the generating curve isn't a circle, the generating curve is a parabola. This is a, a typical technique in trying to analyze a surface. If you have some surface, you're not sure about it. So what does this surface look like? I don't know. But if I cut it with a plane, say like a plane of constant z, I can look at the curve where that plane cuts the surface. If I do that in multiple at multiple levels, then I can start to see the curves that are put together to create that surface. So 
sometimes we call that a trace, right? So the curve, um, if, you take the cur if you take the surface and you cut it with a plane, then you see this curve, and that curve is called the trace. So we're just thinking, like, here's the plane z. We could look at the plane z equals 0 and the plane z equals 1. We're basically cutting the surface with planes and looking at the trace of where that of where that plane cuts the surface in order to understand the shape of the surface. In this case, the traces when we cut with planes of constant z are parabolas. So, and that's why this is a, a parabolic cylinder. <coughs>